Trident Royalties is a diversified mining royalty company and it's growing quickly. It's dual listed and on AIM. The market cap is £109 million. I'm delighted to be joined by the Chief Executive, Adam Davidson. So, Adam, how do royalties work and what's the size of the opportunity in the mining industry? Yeah, so I think they, um, they're pretty simple instruments in that they entitle us as the royalty holder to a percentage of revenue from the underlying operation. So whereas people invest in mining equities and in investing in the actual miners themselves, they're looking to get a cut of profit effectively in the flow through of dividends. So that's the bottom line of the profit and loss statement. We get exposure to the top line, so just revenue, the key thing there being that it's pre-cost. Um, so in an environment like we're in today, you know, gold's above $2,000 an ounce. It's been touching all-time highs. That doesn't necessarily mean that the gold miners, that an individual gold miner, is outperforming where they were this time last year because they're also paying more for labor, for diesel costs, all the inputs um, for, for capital costs if they're, if they're doing some construction work on the mine. So what you can find is the, the actual gold price may be doing well, um, but their profit margin may be, may be tighter than it was last year. So we don't have that exposure. As a royalty holder, we get a cut of their revenue. So it's a way for investors to get direct exposure to, to the actual commodities themselves. Uh, but then they're doing so by a, an instrument that's over particular mines. Otherwise, you can invest in mining ETFs or just metal sort of uh, instruments. The reason people invest in mining equities is because the actual operations usually extend beyond their original plan life. They have expansions and outperform. I think north of 80% of all mines that are built um, extend beyond their initial planned life. So um, so you're getting that exposure because you've got a royalty over the actual operation, but it's a different style of exposure relative to equity. So what does your portfolio consist of? Is it mainly gold mining companies? Now, I use that as a ready example because um, most people are familiar with gold, but our actual breakdown uh, is about 40% lithium exposure at the moment. We've got good tier one lithium exposure uh, in, in the portfolio at 40%. Gold's about 30%. We're, we're pretty happy at that level of exposure. 20% copper, we'd like to see more. And then we've got a smattering across uh, silver, iron ore, a little bit of mineral sand, some zinc lead exposure. And really our prerogative is to, is to broaden out that exposure such that an investor can hold a single share in Trident, uh, but through that share, say, buy a royalties, I've got exposure to the entirety of the mining sector. That, that's the ultimate goal. So I'm just wondering if anybody else does what you do, or are you the only ones and setting the gold standard for mining royalty companies? Yeah, I guess it goes to your first question, which I didn't completely answer, which is what's the size of the prize? Um, so the short answer is there are a few others that do what we do, but really the opportunity that we saw is the mining royalty sector is not tiny. It's 80 billion in aggregate market cap of mining royalty companies around the world. And yet north of 75 billion of that is focused on gold. Um, so they'll occasionally dabble in other stuff, but primarily focused on gold. And yet gold is less than one third of the overall mining sector. So what we see is the dislocation in the space is why is there not a, a multi-billion dollar market cap diversified mining royalty company that's got iron ore and copper and zinc and as well as gold. Um, so so that's what we've set out to build. And there's a couple others like us, but as I said, you know, you can see the size of the opportunity there that there's 75 plus billion in aggregate market cap looking at just gold. And then there's a couple billion in aggregate market cap that's looking at the full diversified sector. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity out there for us. So gold is seen as a safe haven in, in times of distress and turmoil. You don't just have gold companies within the portfolio. But I'm wondering, is your portfolio influenced by macroeconomic factors, including geopolitics and the spectre of, of inflation, for example? Yeah, we, we are. Um, it impacts on a couple aspects. One, when we're doing our due diligence, obviously, macro events, views on commodities, views on particular jurisdictions, those factor into how we would price a, a given transaction when we're when we're looking to buy a royalty over over a given project in a, in a given country. Um, and then, of course, they all ripple through with regards to our actual portfolio. So, as I said, we, we've got we've got about 30 percent of the portfolio in gold at the moment. So using that as an example, we've seen a lot of volatility and we've seen gold pushing up to sort of record highs. Um, and we see that in our revenue because 
although our market cap, as you said, is about 109 million pounds. We're a junior mining company, effectively. Of the 21 assets we've got, 13 are, are cash flowing. Um, so I think we're a little bit different relative to mining juniors. And a similar company of our size would probably not even have a mine yet in production. They might be a development stage story. Whereas we've got, we're generating free cash flow. We cover our GNA, we service our debt. Um, we don't yet generate enough cash to sort of self perpetuate deals. Um, we, we still need financing, whether it's debt or using scripts. Um, to make new acquisitions, um, but slightly different from a lot of our peers in that sense. And, and yes, we, we do see the, the impact on, on our daily sort of cash flow um, from the assets in the portfolio. So let's drill down into those numbers a little bit more. You're talking about cash flow. So what do the most recent numbers demonstrate about the financial robustness of your company? Uh, yeah, so for a company of our size, we've, we've got pretty solid cash flow. Um, I think... Looking at year to date, most of the broker, most of the analysts, uh, research analysts that cover us have it coming in kind of around 10, 11 million this year in revenue, which is probably not too far off the mark. So when you look at kind of GNA, it depends on how active we are because we're spending money on lawyers or technical consultants, but we spend maybe three to four million a year, um, depending how many deals we're working on. And then debt service, we recently announced a new debt facility, which will be much lower cost for us, but for this year, we come in kind of around four million. So you're generating free cash flow there. We're not like many mining juniors that need to go around and raise capital to, to pay listing expenses and, and salaries and that sort of thing. Um, so we've got that sort of security, but really the uptake for us is then when some of the assets that are in our portfolio currently um, that are in construction start to turn on. So our big cornerstone asset, Thacker Pass, a, a monster lithium deposit in North America, a globally significant asset, one of the biggest deposits in the world. General Motors has the offtake for the lithium and is the biggest investor. That's in construction today as we speak. Before the end of the year, they're spending $150 million towards construction. That's going to accelerate next year, and, and first production is targeted for the second half of 2026. It's not the only asset, though, in our portfolio that, that uh, is in construction. We've got others. So you can see a very tangible uptick of when the revenue continues to grow. Um, and that is ultimately what's going to underpin a dividend. That and we've only been in existence for sort of three and a half years. We built up a pretty robust pipeline of, of revenue uh, and assets and, and obviously looking to continue to do so. So you mentioned acquisitions earlier and talking about pipelines. Your fact sheet talks about the pipeline of future opportunities. <laughs> so what's the criteria being applied to these opportunities? And typically, how long does due diligence last? Yeah, it really runs the gambit. This year is a good example of um, markets are depressed. So the mining companies, they either hold royalties on properties they've sold or swapped. Um, so they're looking to monetize those to, to raise capital or or some mining companies, their share price has been so dang where in a normal market, they'd go back to raise, raise some equity. In this kind of market, they don't want to do that. Um, so they either monetize assets they have. Um, which we've we've acquired some of those this year that way, or they'll or they'll raise royalty financing instead of equity, given their share prices are down. So it's 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 you know conversely a really good market for us to go out there and make acquisitions, and we made the most of it this year. Um, we've made five acquisitions uh, across copper, gold, silver, mineral sand. So really happy to be building out the portfolio in this environment. And then the benefit we have is as our portfolio gets bigger and gets more de-risk with the more assets you have, we can actually reduce our cost of capital. We've done so twice this year with our with our debt facility we had at the beginning of the year, we knocked off two percentage points off the coupon early in the year. And then just recently announced we're we're going to be moving into a new revolving credit facility, which knocks down the cost of debt even more. So you know the spread between what our cost of capital is and what we're actually getting on the acquisitions we're making has has widened out in a market like this. So you are still a relatively young company, but within the uh, fact sheet, management deal making capabilities are highlighted. So briefly, who are the deal makers on the board and the management team? Yeah, I'd say there's actually a really good spread. I mean, we're a small team. Another benefit of the royalty model is um, our biggest peer, Franco Nevada, listed on the TFX is, is nearly 30 billion market cap, and they've got some around 40 employees, you know, we're not operating mines, we're buying financial instruments over these mines to get the exposure we get. We've got six employees, um, which which is a, a pretty 
manageable size team, hence why our DNA is so manageable. And the benefit of the model is for each additional dollar we generate in revenue, you don't need to add much headcount. That dollar flows sort of straight through to our bottom line. Um, so to answer your question on who's the deal maker, I think we've all got our own networks and we work collaboratively. We've got guys all over the world as well. Um, you know, colleague down in Perth, Australia. So he looks after that part of the world. I'm in Denver along with another member of the team. And then we've got we've got people in London. So we've got a good global spread. It means a lot of early morning calls and late night calls for us. But between our respective networks and then our board as well, we tap into our non-exec directors who are all active in their own careers, but obviously happy to lend advice and also feed us deal flow. That's one thing I can confidently say is we're not short on deal flow. There, there's plenty of things to look at in an environment like this. And you've got skin in the game because um, director share, share purchases have been regular features on the regulatory news statement flow. No, that's right. Yeah, we, we as you can imagine, as an acquisition business, we're, we're often in closed periods where we, we can't buy shares. But when it does open up, um, which means that we're not in possession of, of, of inside information, we'd like to go out there and buy as many as many shares as we can. Um, so we've been we've been pretty active in that regard. Uh, and then the other thing is our option structure as management. It's important that we're aligned with shareholders. So I encourage people to go to our website. All the details are contained there. But the bulk of our options are effectively um, linked to share price performance. So we've got to get the share price to certain levels um, before those options invest. Um, so we're I've never seen a company that's probably more aligned with shareholders in that regard. And already you've acquired, you've attracted um, lots of big names on the shareholder register. Why are they participating? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the institutions recognize the opportunity. And and now that we've got a track record, we've been talking to a lot of groups, as you can imagine, since inception of the vehicle. Uh, but now we've done 15 transactions. We've got 21 assets, 13 are cash flowing. The share price we listed at 20 TV, we're sitting today at kind of 38. I think we're getting that that critical mass such that some of these good institutional investors that have been following us for a while are taking more meaningful positions. So I think for UK investors, some of the names they recognize, the likes of Ruffer, BlackRock, Amati, that, that sit there as um, major shareholders above the 3% threshold. And then there's there's quite a few that they'd probably recognize just below the 3% threshold. We're, we're very, very pleased with our register. We think it's a good endorsement. So you've got 21 assets. You're a fast growing company, but I'm wondering what the exit strategy is. When do you exit from some of the portfolio components? That's the beautiful thing with royalties is, is you basically just get bigger and bigger and the cash flow gets bigger. And as you get bigger, you get more de-risk and you trade at higher trading multiples. So it's, it's very much a model that's built for scale. So we don't look to exit these things typically, uh, unless there's some real value on the table to do so. But we want to keep keep growing, um, and it all boils back to the business model that these assets tend to extend their mind life. You know, the, a great example is is the Gold Strike royalty that was written in in the 1980s for two million dollars, and uh, is still running today, and it's paid back nearly two billion. And the mine today has a longer life than it did back in the 80s. So when this when the capex gets sunk into a mine they tend to keep going they they try to find a way to extend every single dollar they can and keep these things going so that's that's sort of the free optionality you get as a royalty holder because we're not equity we don't get diluted we've got a royalty over a project say we get one percent of the revenue they generate that's there forever um it doesn't get reduced every time if they go out there and do an equity raise um you know, that doesn't impact us it just means more capital coming into the project we actually like to see that um so yeah, the idea is to, is to build up more more scale within the portfolio. So, the business is growing, but our shareholders ret our shareholder returns also growing within tandem. Talk to me about how investors are rewarded. Yeah, there's a couple ways. One is our share price has, has obviously moved up as we've made acquisitions. The London market's been very responsive to what we're doing, which was a bit of a question mark in the early days because. Almost all of our peers are listed in North America, and it's a model that's very well understood here. And I know the UK now has some music royalty companies. I mean, mining royalties are not hugely dissimilar. We get a cut of revenue. They get it when they, they sell a record or a movie. We get our cut when they generate revenue from selling metal. Um, so I think the model is starting to percolate in the UK. But 
But as we've announced deals, we see the, the market response to that. They like us. They like to see us doing good, smart, uh, accretive acquisitions. Um, so yeah, shareholder returns. I think share prices drifted up. It, we hit peaks of sort of in the upper 50s earlier this year as some key assets were de-risked and moving it con into construction. We haven't been immune to this downward trend over the sort of second half of the year, but bouncing back now. So, um, so yeah, I think share price moving up and then obviously dividends. We're conscious the UK is a very yield focused market. Um, we know it will be a good day for us, for the share price, for everybody when we can announce that inaugural dividend. We just want to make sure we do so at the right time when it's sustainable, when we can put in place a policy that's, that's progressive and, and really highlights that this is a diverse source of cash flow, getting you exposure from everything from nickel, zinc, copper, lithium. We, we want people to get that broad exposure and then have the cash flow coming to them from that. The portfolio is still a work in progress, so we're not quite there yet, but that is that is the ultimate prize. So finally, Adam, you've told me that the market is warming to the model. So you're creating a royalty proof of concept with Trident. Will you remain mining focused only? We will. Yeah, we're we're um we're all mining guys by background. Everybody came out of sort of mining private equity or or banking um and have technical backgrounds to varying degrees. So so very much this is our sector. This is this is where we play. Um and I think the breadth of opportunity we're we're not restricted here um as i said previously we'd we'd like to add zinc and nickel to the portfolio we, we don't have that today at least not in a meaningful way um so we'd, we'd like to expand that um and we've made what i say 15 acquisitions in just over three years so that, that's a blistering pace um so we, we want to continue to grow within the mining sector ultimately what we'd like to get to is yeah, everybody needs to have real asset exposure in their portfolio it's, it's a good to have for an inflation head, uh, all, all kinds of reasons, exposure to the greenification of the economy. Where we'd like to get to is we're trying to almost an index fund style exposure. You can you can get your exposure to real assets, to mining commodities through your holding and trading because we, we get a royalty exposure and then across the whole depth and breadth of the sector. So th that's the ultimate objective. So, you know, work in progress will be in perpetuity, I'm sure. But um, but yeah, we, we, we've got plenty to if you wanted the mining sector. In perpetuity. Thank you very much indeed, Adam Davidson, Chief Executive of Trident Royalties. Thank you very much indeed for joining Master Investor. Great. Thanks, sir.